All right, welcome back everyone. And we are about to start our roundtable conversation moderated by Kia D. London, who is a multifaceted, multifaceted educator with 17 years of experience in teaching of Spanish to K-12 students. She is currently a secondary Spanish teacher at the Latin School of Chicago. She holds an MA in linguistics from Northeastern Illinois University and a BA in Spanish from the University of Iowa. A writer, speaker, and advocate for educational equity, Kia specializes in tailoring language acquisition to diverse learning needs. She is deeply committed to incorporating principles of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging into her teaching. With extensive global experience, including educational trips to countries like Costa Rica and Puerto Rico, Kia brings a rich, worldly perspective to her work. So welcome to Kia D. London and our participants of the round table. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome, welcome. We are going to get started on our discussion. I have notes here, so I know what it is I need to say. Um, <laughs> so welcome, everybody, to Visions for the Future. Um, today, we have a number of different experts um, in their fields. Um, in order to discuss in terms of what is happening now with world language education. So first off, we're gonna start with some quick introductions. Um, if you all can please share your name, um, your affiliation, and a brief overview of what your interest is and or connection is to language education. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patrick Wallace. I work currently with CLET World Languages. But prior to this, I worked at the state level supporting world languages and global workforce initiatives in the state of Georgia, supporting dual language immersion and world language programs across the state. And I also was president for the National Council for State Supervisors for Languages. Grazie. Buongiorno. That's my moment to use Italian because I feel like I'm one of the only Italian speakers here. I am Marina Melita. I am a, a senior lecturer of Italian at Marist College in New York State. I'm also the vice president of colleges and universities for the American Association of Teachers of Italian, um, where there I led the advocacy committee for a few years. And now um, the last couple of years, not this year, but previously, I was also on the ACTFL committee for advocacy. Um, my interest in being here and languages is just um, mainly I wanna keep our programs running strong and getting bigger. That's a mighty lofty goal, and I <laughs> love it. Okay, I'm Heidi Lechner. Um, I teach high school German, and I'm an instructional coach. I am about an hour north of here at Libertyville High School. And um, yeah, my interests are, again, keeping German alive. Uh, German is a small um, force, mighty but small. And um, yeah, it's my passion, and I also have a passion for offering workshops and professional development to give back to the community. I've been doing that the last few years to help educators, where a lot of us are overwhelmed and swamped, and I just hope to make everyone's life a little bit easier every time I can help them. Hello, my name is Joshua Cabral, and I've been teaching for, I guess this is year 27, and I teach French and Spanish. I spent the first half of my career at the high school level, but the last 17 years or so, I have been teaching middle and elementary school, so first through eighth graders. And I work with schools all over the country doing a lot of consulting work with proficiency-based departments. And I also host the World Language Classroom podcast where I love to talk to teachers all the time about language teaching. Hello, my name is Diego Heda, Spanish teacher in Louisville, Kentucky. Diego, what are your interests? <laughs> <laughs> I love soccer. Okay, thank you all so much. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Okay, so the very first segment of this particular discussion is going to be centered on the current state of language education. And I'm gonna go ahead and put the questions up just so everybody can see. 
But what we will do, um, I will ask you all a question. We'll take it one by one. And then once you have a response or you've got a connection or something you want to say, I will go ahead and pass you the mic. Um, the very first question we have you all is, what do you see as the most pressing challenges facing language education today? Well, this is easy for me as a state supervisor, uh, supporting a school system of 1.7 million people and students rather in K-12 K in Georgia. The single biggest issue we face is staffing. And that's not only endemic in world language, but I say across the curriculum, but particularly a challenge in world language and particularly a challenge in dual language immersion. So I think one thing that uh, solution-wise, there's a lot of solutions we've done to try to help that situation. Advertising open positions as a state organization, we've done that. We've done a virtual job fair to help connect uh, talent with jobs. But I think we're just, and there, of course, there's a number of district level things where they provide bonuses for language teachers and incentives. Uh, working, getting certified is not a national one size fits all. Certification is almost state by state, so that makes it really difficult. And in many states, the certifying agency is separate from the government agency that actually, like the DOE. So there's a lot of communication that has to take place and a lot of ba uh, barriers that still have to be lowered, particularly for uh, heritage speaking communities and getting more of them on the pathway to becoming teachers. So I think this is the single greatest challenge we face. And then another related to that is retaining teachers that we have because that's also, we all know that this job is quite challenging. So it's not only about recruiting new teachers into the pathway, but finding ways to retain teachers that we have. Talent is a premium, so I think in the future you're going to see more technology being leveraged to try to help bridge that gap. But bottom line, we need to find new, more educators who want to be and do the work that we're doing because it is so critical. I'm going to jump right on that sure. if I can. I, I was actually going to say that I think part of the issue is political, even though earlier we were talking about not being political, but I think uh, a lot of the barriers that we have are at a political level, are at a level where uh, we all need to be getting involved with our Board of Educations and we need to be working to make those changes from inside out. But I think in a problem that, or a, an issue that, that brings on that problem is that there is a cultural, uh, there's a cultural way of seeing languages and people who don't look like us and cultures that are different from ours uh, in this country as, as being something negative instead of being something positive. Um, I don't know how many times a day I hear, well, why, not only why should someone study a language, but, or why does someone need to do, study a language, but also why do they have to do it in the language? I think there's a lot of misunderstanding in this country as a whole, um, but I think I think we have to get involved at the lower levels of politics and sort of start start making small changes. It starts in the classroom, but it also starts with the parents, with the communities and things like that. And then on the, the issue of staffing, I think one of the things we've seen in Italian, um, and I'm sure it's happening in other languages, um, when an Italian teacher retires, uh, usually at the K through 12 level, that is the perfect opportunity for the district to swoop in and say, we don't have to teach Italian anymore because this person is retired. Now we don't have to worry because there are no Italian teachers out there. We don't have to go looking. So it's a, I see it as a big domino effect all up and down. And German. When the German oh, teacher good. leaves yeah. all the smaller programs, I know I was dying to say that. Yeah. Um, we had to start on a very negative note here, Kia. Um, our <laughs> <laughs> um, the future, it, it's rough. Yeah, we've been in this for decades, and I same thing. Had to ask every day, or been asked every day, the question: Why do we need to learn this? Like, what what is language going to do for me? What is the current figure? Twenty percent of our country, K through twelve, learn a language. I believe twenty percent. 
that is so pathetic. And I, I work in a really privileged district and I have support from the community and we have support for languages. But like you just said, Marina, there's so many parts of our country where you can't find anybody willing to stand up for languages in their entire county because of the political views. So it's, it's beyond that. So yeah, there definitely, there's a lot of things we're, we're working against. I would definitely echo the concern about staffing and retaining teachers, but I also think there's this idea that language is, it's something extra studying a language, that it is for the privileged, it is for the specials, it's along with those types of classes, it's not a requirement for graduation, and until we get to a point where it is seen as equal to all of the other academic pursuits in the school system, we're not going to have the full support that we know that it needs, and that understanding is gonna start, or hopefully it's already there a little bit, that it is much more than just learning the language, but it's all the cultural competency pieces that go along with it, and I think the more that we focus on that, the more they, we can get that buy-in from the greater community of educators. I absolutely agree with everyone here, but I'm gonna say that another challenge is the economy, in the sense that if a country doesn't feel the need to connect with other cultures abroad, like we feel the need in Colombia, in a place like Colombia, where we want to learn languages, not just English, but also German and Italian, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes the economy gives people this idea of a power that they really don't need anything else. Very insightful responses. Thank you all. And Heidi, there is hope, which leads me to the next question. <laughs> Um, are there any recent innovations or trends in language education that you find promising? I hate to always be first. Uh, I would say that yes, I, and then kind of goes back. I want to throw a little sunshine in the room if I can, because I think there a lot of times need uh, creates innovation. So I think that there is a lot of innovation taking place to address the challenges, particularly of staffing, for example. A lot of districts are building pipelines for future educators within their district, identifying members of their staff who are already bilingual and then putting on a track, or students coming out of their language programs and then putting them onto a track to become teachers. I, I do think that expansion is happening in our heritage-speaking communities in terms of recruiting new teachers, drawing them in. I think becoming an educator is a great step for an immigrant coming to in, into our society. It gives them a lot of stability and it gives them a great job. So I think that's really important. And I think we're also becoming more creative in understanding the need to support teachers. There's a lot of organizations out there that are working on this issue. So I'm very optimistic while I recognize it as a challenge. I feel like there are many uh, grassroots and some state level efforts as well. I know in Georgia, for example, there are bonuses for teachers in districts in these areas trying to get who have these specialties in world languages. And I think also there's a need for a greater collaboration with the FLED programs at our universities and colleges and trying to also work on that issue because it's one thing giving students getting them onto the university, but then putting them into a good program. We also have a lot of alternative certification routes for educators, and they're coming into becoming our world language teachers, but they may have gone through an alternative uh, preparation program that was not world language specific. So I think there's a lot of need prof for professional development to meet the gaps that are, are inherent in our, our workforce. Are we gonna have enough time? No. That was my question. Like, I'm gonna wait this one. Okay, I have two things um, that I think are promising in our school district. We're encouraging dual credit as opposed to AP. We have a, we're a huge AP school, but dual credit, you, it's, it's in your hand. You get the credits, um, not just right as soon as you do the course, not just based on a, how you did on a four hour test. Um, so I think offering students seal of biliteracy, um, actual tangibles that will get them somewhere in their future are very important. Um, and my second one is technology. 
I hate to ask, does anybody remember back in the day we had a box of realia because the internet did not exist and you brought home menus and receipts and um, yeah. Well, we have technology and I have, I have boys that come, hey, I talked to someone in Germany on Twitch last night. I don't really know what Twitch is, but I know that they're just talking, playing video games. And I think that's amazing. And I think we have to really leverage all that is out there and how quick it is to be global. I'll just say really quickly that the fact that we're thinking of proficiency-based language teaching as innovation is a little shocking in itself, but that is the truth, that uh, this is innovative, that we're actually focusing on using the language and not teaching about the language. And I think that's a huge step in the right direction and apparently very innovative. <laughs> um, the seal of literacy, very important. Global seal of biliteracy and how they have this uh, event, the creed or cred event that connects our students with students around the world. So I think that's key. Mm -hmm. My piece is very similar to everyone else's, only that I think what we're doing here today is very innovative and I think what's gonna lend credibility to our language classes is that we're talking about all these things. Like you were talking about uh, the 17 goals and then if we're adding social justice as well, I think that's when people are gonna say like, oh, hmm, you can talk about all these things in another language and that might be useful. So I think it's just what you were saying that it's the things we're doing are weirdly innovative even though they're probably what we should have been doing all the time and, and we're paying the price for the sort of rote grammar that was taught 50 years ago, right? We're, we're paying for that now, so. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you all so much um, for those responses. And last question, um, based on what I heard, and I heard very, very insightful connections and responses as far as what is happening within language education, did the pandemic have anything to do with this, and how? Okay, it's a great question. I'll do an analogy. I think the pandemic was kind of a stretching of a rubber band, if you will. And now that we're coming out of the pandemic, we, we're, we're the rubber band that doesn't go back to its original shape. So we have stretched in the pandemic, and I think like every other challenge that has existed in human endeavor, I think that in itself created innovation. So I think that what we will, the, the good, of course we all know the bad that came with the pandemic for sure, but out of this I think it also created new avenues for us to explore in the world language classroom to really develop. I mean our kids are more connected than ever before in some ways that's bad, but I think that uh, that challenged us. So the pandemic was something that we was beyond our control, but I also just think about it from the idea of a global perspective. Here, I always tell people, water doesn't recognize your boundaries. Air does not stop at the United States border. So these things that are endemic for us sharing this spaceship, I always say in world language, we put the us in USA because we, can, we come from everywhere and we can go anywhere. And you know, as a state person, I always had to have those one-liners ready when, this, when a representative asked me why world languages was important. So I think that we, the pandemic was an event that challenged us, but as educators, we are used to challenge. And I think that as educators, we are this, a really critical part of our society. So I think as we have adjusted, we have shown the way. And I think I'm really proud of our educational core across this country and the way they've handled the pandemic. I mean, it was not easy, but I think, I mean, I'm I, I, my wife is a teacher, so I saw it every day. She was teaching through a mask, teaching Spanish through a mask for a year. And yet coming out of that, you know, just she was, you know, it was, it was a challenge, but we're still very, very important. That's my take. So I would just quickly piggyback on that and say that I'm very much a make lemonade out of lemonade, like make lemonade out of lemons kind of person. So the pandemic was my jam, no. Um, but I think that within that situation, we saw a lot of inequality. You could see the students that had access and the students that did not. And that's definitely not a 
lemonade situation, but it provided us with an opportunity to address it and to bring it center to our teaching. And also in terms of SEL and social emotional learning, we, all of us, had to embrace that with our students. And I personally can never go back to not having that lens on my teaching. And I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have been stretched in that way. Um, I'd like to say something about assessments. During the pandemic, anything Googleable was thrown out in my classroom because we were online. And with a click of a button on your computer, you could find the answer for certain things. So that changed drastically. To my, I mean, I was always a proficiency classroom for the last few years, but really kids, you know, it's shifted to what can you do on the spot without preparation. And um, that's changed. I've kept that mindset and, and the kids have really benefited from it, I believe. And it's hard. Some teachers that weren't able to make that shift. And I think that leads then to, to the other things we talked about. I mean, what you, what you, yeah. is it on? Yeah. I think what you were just saying um, about doing things on the spot is really how we learn language originally, right? So I think, I think that was a really good thing about um, the pandemic. And I also, I, I totally agree about we've been stretched. I personally don't think we should try to go back. I think what scares me now is um, we see, even in my own institution, there is a push to go back to doing things like we did before the pandemic, which, as you were just saying, can also be problematic because I think our eyes were opened on so many different levels. And yes, if somebody didn't have a computer that the, the pandemic was inequitable for them, but you also started to realize all the other things that are not equitable about, even just about teaching a language, and then we bring back this whole idea about it being a privilege. And if we stop thinking about it as a privilege and think about it as a right, as something people deserve, no matter who they are, that changes our entire uh, way we teach. So I, for one, I mean, I never thought I'd say it three years ago, but I'm actually glad that I had the experience. Um, and the one thing I was really excited about for that is a little less um, academic was everybody decided to get a new hobby. And a lot of people thought, wow, this is the time to learn a language. And I, I, it's true. I, I think in some ways we actually are benefiting, benefiting from that now. And I, I would not have expected that. So uh, it was frustrating. Um, I had to stay home uh, during the pandemic and the year after the pandemic because my daughter didn't have school and uh, she's a special need, so I had to be with her at home. So I had to teach some classes from home. And when I came back to school the following year, it took me at least a year and a half to get used again to be in the classroom and try to be myself. So if it took me that long, let's think about our students. You know, they are still probably in that mode. Okay, thank you all so much for that. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next segment. Uh, strategies for promoting language programs. And here are the questions. We're gonna start with the very first question. What strategies have you found effective in promoting language programs in schools? So at the state level in Georgia, I would say that the single, one of the, it seems to me one of the best arguments I could make, and it's been brought up before, it's maybe not always the only conversation we should have, but making an economic argument for languages in the state of Georgia was really important. Um, you know, we have the busiest airport in the world. Um, we have a very large, fast-growing port. And I think uh, connecting languages with um, 
CTAE pathways is also a direction we could go in. I, in, uh, in Georgia, I was responsible for starting a grant called the Cross-Curriculum Innovation Grant. And the idea was to connect, give grants to teachers, world language teachers, who were connecting what they were doing with other areas of the curriculum. So I think, you know, we talk about, I've always been uh, one of those that spoke against uh, the language in a box sort of way of doing language. And if we go back 30 years, you know, language was by itself. We went to Spanish class but we didn't really connect it with the other parts of the school. And I think that a more modern way of thinking of education is to be more inclusive and interrelated in the actual field. So I definitely feel like drawing a line between language and the career fields and how language can accelerate that is a good argument, both politically, a safe argument in some cases, I would say, just because that's one that I know as a state level, you operate as a bridge between policy and practice. So you're trying to find those points of resonance which advocate for, and I think that it's one reason why in Georgia, in the last couple of years, we were able to provide over a half a million dollars in funding to support world language programs. So I think that experience taught me that the economic uh, message was really, really important. In a state that might be more conservative than other states, it still resonates. So I think that's one point I would make. And the, someone talking about the UN sustainability goals, I think that's also a good connection to make with the world language classroom, talking about that global uh, component. I always, whenever I show to, I started a talk on world language, I always start with a picture of the earth because it was a reminder that in language, we were not only teaching language, but we were also teaching that we were part of a global community and reminding students, American students in particular, with a myopic view sometimes of the world, that we are part of a greater community and that is humanity. And so it's really important, I think, what we do. I'm gonna take it from there. Um, as a Spanish teacher, I have to talk about the Hispanic community in the United States, and I have not found any strategy that is more effective than that one, to talk about uh, who is the Hispanic community in the United States. Raise your hand if you know a Hispanic person. See? Raise your hand. Okay, so make them feel part of it and to realize that the Hispanic community is here not as guests or visitors, but as part of the community. So kind of like making it the US, in the US, global and US. Oh, go ahead. Okay, I was just gonna say, I was gonna speak from a more practical level um, because not all of us do have the ability to work at the higher level um, and, and have the government's ear. Um, but I have to, I run a program myself and I try to help uh, K through 12 instructors keep their programs in Italian going, especially in the greater tri-state area. Um, I think one of the most important things that we can do, especially as educators, is make sure that not just the students, but the parents and the community members, especially community groups that are focused on uh, language adjacent topics are really good people to make part of your program and to work with them in order to ensure that your program is uh, current, has money, uh, has publicity, has a lot of activities going. Um, you know, it's in my idea, my way of thinking about it, at least uh, with Italian, is having, having the community start believing that the Italian program is also their Italian program, that it's not just about the, what's happening in the school, but how can they help contribute to it? How do we get the parents to say, yes, I want to be a part of this, I want to help strengthen it. Um, so we do, I mean, at least from the Italian side of things, that's the kind of work we're trying to do is more of a bottom up than a top down. Um, we know things are gonna get cut because of funding. What tends to happen, um, and again, I, it might be different with Spanish and French, they're slightly larger, but I know things like German and Italian ha struggle a lot. and when it comes down to the funding issue and an Italian program is on the chopping block, the best way to save that program and to promote it is to have those local community partners who stand up and say, you know what, I'm gonna take my scholarship away 
if you don't keep offering Italian. You know what, we're gonna, we're gonna take, we're not gonna lend you our name for that building or whatever the plan is. And it does work, and again, it's along the, the lines of economy, but you're also making sure that the com community is, is, is locked tight with these programs. So I think, I think it has to come from both ways when we were talking about making sure that those programs thrive and survive. So coming from an elementary standpoint, and I work with a lot of schools that are trying, districts that are trying to get their school boards to fund elementary programs, which are not very widespread. And I champion all the, the efforts that we've talked about up here, but if you're starting from the trenches of trying to get a school board to go with funding, we need to make the connection about how the real academic skills are happening in our language classes and we're supporting it. Just like we wouldn't say that in a chemistry class, they're not using their math, they're complementary. We have to have that same conversation about literacy is happening in our world language classes. That reading is happening, that writing is happening. They are doing research projects that all of those, those really important and needed and effective academic skills are happening there, and it's yet another place that they are honing their skills in that area. And in order to make that happen, I would say we need to be marketing masters for ourselves, at least in smaller programs, that's what we do. I send a parent newsletter, which is very elementary, um, twice a month with pictures of the kids in action and short descriptions of all of the things we're doing. And that has just made the biggest impact because, we, as we know, teenagers don't really talk to parents. And that's a glimpse of them in action in their daily life. Of all the parents on my side, they reach out and they're so supportive. So I think everything you just said, but that's a tangible. Like, how do you get the community? Talk to them, include them, and invite them. I think just to piggyback quickly on that, that when it comes to state testing, a lot of states don't have state testing for world language. It's not one of those. But if we can show how we are helping them and bolstering their performance on the, in the areas that are tested by the skills they're learning in our classroom, then we can you know, keep in the conversation. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to move on to segment three because I really feel like you all already touched, touched on how we can better integrate language learning um, into the broader educational curriculum. And I also heard some examples of successful partnerships and or collaborations. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move on to segment three. Okay, so in this segment, we're gonna be talking about the future of language education. And the very first question we have is, what do you envision as the future of language education in the United States? Thank you for starting with a small question. I think that the future of world language education will be a much more, I think that we are going to continue to work toward providing the global perspective in education. I believe that the future of world language will have sort of hybrid, different hybrids and situations. I think, as I said, I want world languages to be out, let loose out of the box of thinking of world language in the context that it's one discipline in a line of disciplines. And when we think about disciplines, we need to think about career, we need to think about how they all work together to make a complete human. So I think that um, the integration of language across the curriculum I think is really important. And I would also say culture across the curriculum and that eff those efforts are ongoing. I think that uh, hopefully we will have more inclusion and more accessibility to the teacher career field. And I hope that our teacher careers uh, our people who are in teaching, that's gonna become a more diverse body. And I'm, I'm super happy about that. I think that we need that. So in a general sense, I feel always optimistic, but I'm a glass half full kind of guy. 
but I really feel optimistic because I know the quality of our teachers and I know the work that you do. I've done it myself for 24 years in the classroom prior to serving at the state level. And having seen at the state level what's there, I see the writing on the wall. I always tell people at the end of the book, guys, we, we, we are there. Because I think at the end of the book, um, we have a society, I hope, that is more um, connected and more understanding, more culturally aware, interculturally aware, um, and that takes time. But I think we have to I always say I'm like water. I always try to flow to those areas where I can flow and get, and water makes big tracks, but it might start with a small stream. So I think we also have to have a lot of patience sometimes, but I think we have to be impatiently patient, if I can say it that way, because we've been patient for a long time, haven't we? So, but I think it requires us to continue to, to work toward the future. It's always hard to think about 20 years down the road because things have changed so much in the last five. But I think that um, what we came out of these last through things and as society is changing, we're realizing the greater importance in understanding not only language, but intercultural understanding uh, and recognizing who we are as a people collectively and individually. Um, we, we, we're talking about things that kind of like show us the current state of education and world language education. Uh, we're here because we have an interest. We want to learn. We want to listen to different perspectives. But not every teacher has that opportunity. And when I interact with different teachers online on workshops, you can see that we're a little bit in trouble as far as like language education in the United States. So when we think about the future, it's important to think about what brought us here to this point. Why are we here where many of our students are not motivated to uh, learn a second language? And I strongly believe that we need to move from the assignment to the experiential learning. That was actually going to be my comment. I, I, no, 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 I agree with you 100%. I think, I think we're looking at a non-traditional classroom. I think we are not, th we are not front-facing our students. If people are still doing that, I would recommend not. Um, moving our chairs around, experiential learning, um, project-based learning, I think it's going to be huge. And I think we're looking at world languages that are far more integrated uh, with other inter interdisciplinary programs. Um, I just sat on a committee to uh, begin a new global studies major at my own university, and I insisted on being on that committee because languages were not um, represented otherwise. And in doing so, I made sure that now, if you're a global studies major, you have a three semester requirement of a language. We do not have a language requirement at our school. Um, so yes, I got the language classes in, but now I have to make sure they stay. And I think the way to do that is b making sure that those courses are running parallel to the global studies curriculum, to the such issues of social justice, to all the other possible combinations that, that we can make around our campuses and also our, our schools uh, specifically. And I, I think that, I think this whole language is in a box. Again, I, I think that was maybe where things went wrong in the past. And I think, I think we do have an opportunity to change that now. Well, I think there's a paradigm shift going on right now with assessment. And we have been talking about proficiency in using the language for the better part of a decade now, but then trying to retrofit that into a very archaic and traditional grading system that's based on percentages and letters and all of that. I think that paradigm shift is happening right now. And it's a little bit of a, what came first, chicken or the egg there, but um, I think the more we can work on what that assessment looks like, the more it'll be obvious to students the reason why they are engaging in learning about culture and cultural competence and their language, and that it's not for that test grade. Because as much as we've been doing the proficiency thing, they get a report card and it still has a grade that represents something that's pretty archaic. I was just going to say, somebody brought it up today about, was it you, about grading versus ungrading? Oh, I, 
or someone, I, I am all about not grading because I think the students actually do far better and they engage more with the activity instead of worrying so much about like, oh, what am I, what is the right answer to this? I don't know, it's a language, it could have 20 right answers, you know, <laughs> so. Okay, so in addition to what you all shared, what role does AI play into the future of language education? I can't wait to hear these answers. <laughs> well, it's missing a few pieces, but it's got the interactivity and it's, it's the shift that we need to start, I mean, as an example. And um, I've been loving, the, I don't know about all of you, the new AI products, and I've jumped on that, that bandwagon just to see what they can do, and it's gonna shift our language world immensely, I feel, in the next few years. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I just think it's another opportunity to get creative. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure if we went back several decades back, well, more than that, when that calculator came out, <laughs> Math people were saying, nobody's ever gonna learn how to add anymore. And we figured out how to leverage it to do wonderful things, like the little computers that are in our pockets right now. So I, I, I'm hopeful that we are going to continue to find creative ways to use it and leverage it to do great things. And we need to get creative with the prompts, yes. right? And um, the, the thing is that I, it's scary because it seems so complex. And uh, I, I don't feel I'm ready for that. But then when I see Sergio Troitino's webinar on artificial intelligence, I see there's an application here, you know, that can help us in the classroom, but it will take time to get there. I was just gonna say that I'm optimistic. And I think that's because I know that language is more of a fluid than a, a solid. So I think it will adapt and we will adapt. And I think that that story is evolving. So I love the comments made here by the panel. Okay, thank you all so much. There is one more question that I kind of forgot. So we're gonna take a look at this one. Um, I know we, we kind of talked about this a little earlier, but if anything else comes to mind, what policy changes would you all recommend to support language education? I mean, the biggest thing I would say is we have to be, we're always talking about the U.S. compared to other countries. Let's do what other countries do and have national language requirements so that everybody has to learn two or three languages. I mean, I, to me, that's the least common denominator. Yeah, I would just echo that and say also, though, that that's going to have to come with a much more robust effort to put teachers in the classroom who are qualified because if they came out and said tomorrow, hey, world languages is required, K-12, that's nice, but physically it's not gonna happen because there's no education force out there that, that is ready to take on that task. So it's gonna have to be a gradual sort of growth, but we definitely think, and that's where I, I'm always, because I'm just who I am and who I've, what I've, I've lived in a state agency now for six years, I always think we have to uh, come back to the economic in some ways and say, hey, you know, if you really want to be a global economic power or have diplomatic power or m even military power, you cannot do this in the absence of uh, some sort of global educational understanding for kids. I always go back to the Germany. Here's this country that's smaller than the state of Texas and is the third largest exporting country in the world. How did they do that? Well, their mandatory language learning is one part of that, but also they encourage their young people to travel and study abroad, and it's even built into their educational system. And also the idea of taking these small and medium-sized companies and expanding them on a global scale, something that every state wants their companies to do, because by doing so, they're more profitable and they're more sustainable because they're not dependent on one single market. So I think that all of these factors play into that. I will once again champion elementary programs because I think that is like 
find some money, make it happen there. I was having a conversation with someone this morning as we were talking about the social justice oriented curriculum and how do we do that with a first grader? How do you do that with a second grader? And we were talking about doing simple things like the images you expose them to do not show poverty in this country that they associate with poverty. That it's a realistic part, but it's not the only part. And just make it part of, you're talking about the house, you're talking about family, you're talking about what you do, you're talking about food. and just starting there, they're not having that conversation and really understanding you know, what's behind it, but it's beginning to show them the, the wealth of experience and culture in the world, but that, that we need to start it earlier. I'll say let's keep pushing to diversify the American Council of Teaching Foreign Languages, not just having the little special interest groups, and uh, it's great that we have um, a vis vi visible leadership uh, that is diverse, but in the end, the decision making is probably on the same hands. Okay. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, a lot of insightful um, reflections, comments, and solutions, and a lot for us to continue to think about. Now we are going to go ahead and open up to Q&A, question and answers. If you all have any questions that are on your mind right now for any of our panelists, We do have some questions from our virtual online participants. So the first one is, um, why legislators are afraid of the word global citizens? Why are they afraid of that word? That is an excellent question to the online audience. I know in my work at the state level, in some ways, that was also a trigger word I found. So I think that, I think that it's just, it's global is global in one way or another. So they, when you look at um, something, you bring your own perspective to it. One person might see a tool, another might see a weapon. So I think this idea of global education, because of some, some perspectives, they might see that in a threatening way. And then us, we think about it as a very positive. So I think Sometimes I've learned that the term is not so important as much as the, the direction that you're going. So I think that when I talk about global education, I'm talking about really just understanding the interconnectedness and the, the putting on an equal value all perspectives that are in the world. And I think that is frightening in a lot of ways to think of an egalitarian sort of thing like that because the reality is we are also in these structures, these government structures, whether it's your school or even in societal structures, that the tendency is sometimes, it's kind of like one of those, it's almost like Machiavelli in some ways where power tries to seek to maintain that power. So I think that um, for me, I think about global education as really, I think it's happening to some degree anyway in some ways because there was always a quote I loved as a kid, and it was, beware of those who would restrict your access to information because in their minds they dream, your, dream themselves your masters. So I think the availability of information, but I also am fearful of the fact that so many people now, even though we live in an age where there's much more access to information than ever, ever before, because of our views, we focus on only one viewpoint, or we only get our information from one source. And to me, that's incredibly dangerous. Just as a German teacher myself, I've seen some of the effects of that. So we just really need to protect um, an egalitarian field where all voices are heard and valued, and that resonates. So I don't know how we do that particularly, but I say that in my world, when I dream of a, a world, uh, I think about global in the sense of us 
being understanding of other people and other backgrounds and building that ability to interact with the new in a non-confrontational way, not assuming, not bringing our assumptions. Um, it's a really hard thing to discuss in some ways, just from the background, but we definitely have to keep an open mind. I'll say that. Legislators are the same everywhere in the world, and they are scared of anything that will take their power out of their hands, and they came to where they are because a specific discourse, a speech, and they don't want to change that. Do we have any questions from the people sitting in the audience? Because I do have another virtual one, but I'd like to extend it to the, to the people sitting here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, many of you, if I'm, unless I missed something, are um, K through 12 teachers, and I want to hear from you to people like me who are at the college level in teacher preparation. What advice do you have for teacher education programs? Thank you. In languages, do not focus on grammar. Focus on proficiency. So in speaking with a lot of younger teachers coming into the profession, I have a term that I use for them, and it is they are the proficiency natives. And so many of us are the proficiency immigrants. So when we use the, when we talk about technology, we have the technology natives and the technology immigrants where we had to learn technology and these kids born these days, they're the technology natives. They just know how to pick up an iPhone and use it. And I think that those students going through the programs right now, they are the proficiency natives. They've had teachers that have already been engrossed in this proficiency world. And just to keep championing that, that um, it's, and if there's anything happening within the program that's gonna be contrary to that in terms of the way teaching is gonna happen, it's like, no, think back to those proficiency-based teachers you had in high school, because it's been in the last decade, they've been there and they've had them. First of all, if you're a FLED teacher, a big thank you as well for preparing the future teachers for entering our pathway. I think one piece of advice that I have for you that I've, that's, I've seen as successful is, is to work on those connections with those feeder world language programs in your district and in the area of your university or FLED program. I think that uh, it's really important because I know that FLED programs, just like our world language programs, are under threat. Uh, honestly, when FLED programs get, I, I have witnessed in our state that sometimes FLED programs do get cut. I mean, just because there's not enough people in those programs. So it's not only about preserving our world language educators that we have now and ensuring a pipeline for the future. We definitely have to also talk about our FLED programs and how can we continue to maintain them because the quality of a teacher coming out of a FLED program is much higher and more knowledgeable than a quality of a teacher coming out of a, an alternative pathway to certification where they don't have that language specific background. And so I think that's really critical. So one thing on the professional development side is we are having, we need to offer a lot more things to, to help our teacher core with the things that they would have gotten in a FLED program, but if they came in an alternative direction, we need to give them that information as well, at least what they need to be successful. So thank you for your work, and I think that the, what I would suggest is continue to look for innovative ways to connect with the K-12 pipeline of future educators, and then also connecting with heritage speaking communities also. We did, in Georgia for example, we did a professional learning community that was in Spanish and our, our specific, it was led by a FLED teacher and it was done in Spanish and it was particularly get the word out to the heritage speaking communities about the pathway to certification because that's not a message they get in Spanish all the time. So I think that's also, there are some language barriers still in the, in the pathway. I know sometimes our tests for becoming teachers were only offered in English. So how is a dual language immersion teacher from Puerto Rico who is a wonderful teacher and they're asked to take a test and pass it in basic skills in English in order to become a teacher? They, they might fail math in English, but they're a great teacher, but you've 
you've, you, you're judging a fish on its ability to fly, and we need to stop doing that. I would say I was in thinking about your question and listening to everybody's responses. Um, a culturally responsive teaching is that culture responsive. Centering that is really important, um, especially for the teachers that are coming through in terms of making sure that they have an understanding of the importance of valuing the students' identities, their background, their experiences, as well as their culture. Um, in addition to that, um, I, it also goes back to equity and representation and being able to relay the message and the teaching of that. This isn't just one particular aspect of a community. There are a number of different faces that you have that represent the community. So we have another question online, and it's um, similar in that, uh, how are we bringing more diverse students to the Spanish classroom? This particular uh, teacher says that they do not have very many African-American students that reach the AP Spanish language and AP Spanish literature level, and so they want to know how can they get more diversity within their student population at those higher levels of language. Okay, I can answer that. Um, thank you for clarifying that, because I didn't know what she meant by diverse. Like, are we talking racially diversity? Are we talking yes, about learning racial, styles? Yes, racial diversity okay. in the higher level classes. Um, so I, I'm gonna try and make this short, but personally speaking, I can speak to that. Um, when I was growing up, my parents spoke Spanish to me in the home, but then I learned it formally through middle school or through high school. Um, and I had a very natural gift, connection to it, and it resonated. And I worked my way all the way up to Spanish AP. And I remember the end of first semester, I ended up dropping it. Um, I was the only um, African American um, in my AP Spanish class. And as I reflected on that experience, I will personally say the support, there needs to be a support system put in place um, specifically for, um, I guess in this case, African American students, especially if you know that the percentage gets less and less and less really take a look at the support systems. If it means um, a mentoring type relationship between the student and the teacher, or even um, you know, getting together with the teachers within your world language department and talking about the issue, as well as putting together some action steps of how can we support um, African-American students if we know that this is happening. I just wanted to add, um, LJ Randolph talked about that this morning about uh, changing the curriculum so that all students see themselves in it. So uh, for those watching online, if you missed it this morning, go watch the recording. Fabulous examples of how you can do that. Do we have another in in-person question, in-house question we'd like to answer? So I have one question for all of you, just to share a tip for anyone watching at home, for anyone here, that, you know, what's, what's one thing that if, if they, someone could enact next week with their students to make their class more engaging, a better, more fun place to be for their students, for them to learn more of the language you teach. What's one thing that you're like, this is my personal tip that I want to give out? And I'll give the other microphone. Let's make it a, let's make it a more democratic place. Let's uh, share the power and uh, let's make them feel part of the decision making. I would second that um, and say that part of that 
that decision making power is to make sure that you are talking about and learning about things that they're interested in. As I get older, I realize that the things I find interesting are not interesting to teenagers at all anymore. So I, I am not. My mother would be really happy that you said that though. Uh, but it's the, the this idea of what is it that you want to learn about? Because I think a lot of times the ideas that we think are of interest aren't necessarily of interest. So talk to them, figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, combining a few things here, I would say get out of your own way. Um, if you're in front of the class, get out, as was already mentioned. Go to the back of the room and let the students lead and let them choose. What do they want to learn and ask for student input and make them responsible and, and they'll lead the class. It's funny, I do something s similar to all those, but one thing I love to do, and, and some of my friends joke that I'm lazy, is sometimes I like to let the students do the teaching. Uh, I think somebody this morning, uh, our first speaker, she had lost her voice and she let the students run the classroom. And I find this to be one of the most effective ways of getting the students involved. Um, sometimes I tell them ahead of time and sometimes I don't. And I just say, read that and then let's go for it. Teach your classmates. Okay, I'm gonna go a different, well, I would just say, remember why you love what you do. Remember your love for the language first and foremost and make sure you feed that love so you can spread that love. I think sometimes when we become teachers, we think about it in a more mechanical aspect, like I'm trying to teach it. But you remember why you love languages, and I think it's important for us to continually make time and space available, an opportunity available for ourselves as individuals to fall in love with what we're doing, fall in love with the language and culture that we're bringing into the table. So um, I know in the pandemic, you know, it was just, it was also brought out to me that it just really, there was so much asked of our teachers, far and above what they had ever thought that they would have been asked to do. And we saw a lot of teacher burnout. And so I think that we just need to, in order to have a sustainable thing, we just need to remember to make space for ourselves so that we, we can then take that light that's been reignited back into the classroom instead of just letting it smolder under all that weight that comes with teaching find that space for yourself. I have a district coordinator who says, I don't email my teachers at all during summer break. You know, I just don't want them to think about school at all. So I think you have to build that space for you personally. Opportunities are there for teachers, I think, but, but make a way that you, you don't fall out of love with what you're doing. Okay, I'm thinking you all took mine. It's okay. No, it's all good. I echo what everybody said up here. Um, one thing I will say, um, check-ins, I, I don't know if somebody mentioned that earlier, but checking in with them is great. I mean, I use a Google form um, and I'll ask them, like, how are things going? What What is it that I need to change? Am I speaking in the target language too fast? Um, which, you know, which is it? Um, and I've found that that has been really helpful um, and really supportive in driving my instruction as well as putting the students first and centering them, which is what we heard up here. Um, so thank you all so much um, for joining us. And those of you that are online, thank you so much for tuning in. This concludes our panel discussion. And thank you for the awesome panelists up here. Let's give them a hand, you all. Thank you.